So first I want to start with my acknowledgements because this type of work is laborious. Um, it's long. It takes a army to get this done, early intervention research. Um, and of course, I would be nowhere without um, my colleagues and collaborators, especially Dr. Connie Kazari, who serves as principal investigator on many of these projects I'm going to present today. Um, Drs. Tanya Paparella and Stephanie Freeman, who have been longtime collaborators and who graciously allowed us to do a randomized control trial out of their intensive um, intervention program at UCLA, and I'm going to present some of that data today. Um, Dr. Gerhard Hellman, who is my right-hand man, he's my biostats consultant, nothing would happen without him. Um, and then I'm going to be presenting a little bit of work from one of our graduate students, it's her, um, her master's thesis um, that ties in well with my talk today. Um, and of course, a special thank you to the families. You know, the families are so committed to this work. They come back years and years and follow up so that we can look at their children's outcomes. They're amazing, they're spirited, their children make amazing gains, um, and it's truly a joy to work with these families. Um, and then my, my, our funding from NIH, I also received a postdoc fellowship through Autism Speaks to do some of this work, so I wanted to um, thank those agencies as well. So as means of overview, I'm really going to review the basics of behavioral therapies in autism spectrum disorder, um, but really by highlighting some, re some, some relevant recent advancements in the field that I think are important for us all to think about, um, and particularly with a focus on um, more targeted interventions, more targeted social communication interventions, some of which are occurring here at UCLA. So the UCLA JASPER model, um, which stands for the Joint Attention, Symbolic Play, Engagement and Regulation, which is a targeted social communication intervention. And I'll be talking about those findings within the broader context of targeted social communication um, therapies for, for ASD. So what do we know in general about behavioral treatments? Um, the buzzword out and about is ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. Um, really, it comes down to ABA is a broad term. It, it really encompasses a lot of different approaches um, for treating ASD, and it's really the science of analyzing behavior that's relevant for these social outcomes in children with ASD. Um, it has the strongest evidence base by far, so we have a lot of families who, when their child is diagnosed with ASD, they're, li they're likely to enter into ABA services, some of which can be intensive, 40 hours or more a week for some of these families. So I think it's incredibly important for us to understand what are these therapies actually doing um, how are they changing children's lives and how are children, what are children looking like longitudinally once they've, they've partaked in these interventions? Um, and to depict what a broad term this is, I have a little continuum here. And down here I have several kind of of the buzzword, I would say, programs out and about. Um, uh, here, here's Jasper, our UCLA program, uh, PRT, Pivotal Response Training, um, out of the Kegels in Santa Barbara, ESDM has gotten some really um, interesting um, headlines lately, Early Start Denver model. Um, but more classically, if you look across the spectrum and you think about it in terms of being a spectrum from kind of more traditional, structured, adult-led therapies, all the way across the continuum to more maybe naturalistic, child-led um, techniques, you can see that they all fall within that spectrum, and, it, and similarly, they all have different emphasis. So DTT, um, you know, made famous by Ivar Lovas here at UCLA, discrete trial training is a highly structured, um, adult facilitated interaction that can be very comprehensive. The DTT can occur in the home upwards of 40 hours a week. Um, all the way down to our more 
child-led, child-directed therapies such as floor time or DIR, which really focuses on more child initiations, child's motivations, and really focuses on following the child's lead more than being adult facilitated. But all I would argue, uh, floor time maybe not, would be the only one that would be a question mark, would fall under the umbrella of ABA because we're changing behaviors. Anytime you talk about cause and effect, behavior plans, changing behaviors that makes um, for children with ASD, we're talking about applied behavior analysis. So it depends on what, you, what approach you take within that umbrella. What's interesting about this um, in general is that when you look at each individual <coughs> therapy out in the community, they actually are more alike than they are different. Um, I have a lot of families who come um, and they're trying to tease apart the differences and the different types of therapies that they're being offered either by regional center um, or by the school. And it, it's, it's very striking to me that there are actually very common features and I think that's a good thing um, in the field that we've all converged on some very important um, principles. Uh, but traditional ABA, so there's more highly structured interventions, really have focused on improvements in overall cognitive functioning. So the initial evar Lovas trials found that with more intensive DTT, that they found longitudinal outcomes on child's um, standardized IQ, um, as well as school placement, um, and decreases in disruptive behaviors. But um, I would argue that there's been a really a, a more fairly recent shift to really emphasize more of the core features of the disorder um, and think about what is it that's unique to ASD. And one theme that's really come up a lot is the social communication impairment. And so how do we, how do we treat and target and think about maximizing outcomes in that domain? And we've had some really nice successes over the last couple of years that I want to highlight. Um, so several, RCT is short for randomized control trial. These are different designs that we use to test efficacy. Um, and uh, SSD is single subject design. It's another type of methodology used to, to, to test er early interventions and interventions in general. And Generally speaking, we have many, we have had a handful of trials for preschoolers, so three to five year olds, um, who have found really nice evidence supporting targeted social communication therapies for preschoolers with ASD. Uh, our, our own group found that you know, if we randomize children to receive a social communication intervention, they do better in surprise, surprise, social communication over time um, than a control um, condition would. Um, uh, Brooke Ingersoll's group has a pilot RCT that has shown when you teach reciprocal imitation, that improves in young children, um, as well as Rebecca Landa's group. Um, has had a similar finding where she looked at different classrooms that infused what she called interpersonal synchrony in one classroom, and then the other classroom had kind of more of a standard ABA curriculum. And she found that in that interpersonal synchrony infused classroom, children became better social imitators over time. So we have some evidence to suggest that social communication interventions for preschoolers can work. There's also really important evidence to suggest that working on social communication early actually has implications for later language development, which is critical. So what we do early matters for later de development, and I would say I would urge us all to think about that as an important piece. So just to, to summarize um, one of our own studies, this is a slide now, an old slide from, from, from long ago, so um, I won't you know, spend too much time, but this time point four is actually one year post-intervention. And what that show, this shows is that children who received active social communication interventions actually increased even after a year after treatment in outcomes such as initiating joint attention, their play, and that language ability, right? So, so we've actually found that over time, they, they get our short-term intervention, they get a nice bump, and then when we see them a year later, they, they're maintaining that over the, the purple control condition that didn't receive the active treatment. 
So I would, I would argue that this has pretty strong implications for children even younger um, than preschoolers. And so the field in general has made a real effort, and I'm sorry, this is a really busy slide, I'll just kind of go through it, um, uh, where we've, we've looked at toddlers. So now we know that we can change outcomes in preschoolers. We want to look and see if we can do this in younger children, two to three year olds. Um, and we think that social communication interventions in general are well suited for young children. Um, it's one of the first signs that manifests in these young children. And a real emphasis on parent involvement has um, been, been a piece of this. So parent mediated interventions where parents are taught specific strategies to help facilitate some of the early social communication in their children. But interestingly, we've had some mixed results in the field over the last few years um, that I'll, I'll do my best to explain. Um, in general, I think we're finding pretty positive dyadic outcomes. So when you look at outcomes that are within a mother-child or a caregiver-child interaction, we're doing pretty well. So we teach parents to interact with their children in specific ways and use strategies, and that seems to really be helping overall in their interactions, in the amount of time they can play and interact together, in the overall initiations of social communication their children are doing. But in general, I think the field has struggled some um, to, to actually find more standard, standardized measures of perf performance over time. So, um, so Carter et al. did um, an RCT recently of the Hannon More Than Words program. Um, I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but she actually didn't find any um, treatment effects above and beyond a community control when she looked at was measuring parental responsiveness and language outcomes in these children. As well, um, Green and colleagues did a very large scale study um, and found that his RCT also struggled to find kind of more generalized and standardized outcomes in these kids above and beyond what a community control condition was, how a community control comparative con condition was developing. Um, so we have some work to do. So we're finding some mixed findings, I think, in the toddler population. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time highlighting um, some recent finding, um, findings from um, Dawson and colleagues, the Early Start Denver model. Um, that's received some attention in the media recently, and I think it's a worthy thing for us to think about. Um, and essentially, um, this is a comprehensive treatment program where you know children can be in this in this uh, program for about the, this trial was two years long, so it's fairly intensive. The children are in there, um, and they they were able to find some very nice findings, um, some improvements in cognition and adaptive functioning. They didn't find as many language or social communication specific outcomes as some of the more targeted treatments have. Um, they also had a recent um, article out showing brain differences at exit um, using EEG methodology. And, um, you know, I think this is re a really exciting place for us to think about actually changing the brain and measuring how behavioral therapies can really start to change developmental trajectories and, and, and the brain's development over time. One thing I would um, I would think about is, and UCLA is now going to do this, so this is exciting, is actually <coughs> taking careful pre-post measures of um, brain activity to look at true change over time and not just using kind of a cross-sectional one-time point um, design. So now I'm going to dive into some of our, our new work um, here at UCLA um, with our, social, our targeted social communication intervention, JASPER. Um, this, uh, is, this, this work is in preparation. We'll be submitting it hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, so it's pretty hot off the presses. Uh, but we did a randomized control trial with uh, 86 parent-child dyads. And these, um, this was a unique study design in several ways, one of which is that we actually used two active treatments and we compared them to each other. Whereas most classically, um, behavioral therapies are looking at one treatment compared to community or treatment as usual or no treatment at all. 
Um, we actually used a design where we looked at two empirically supported treatments, Jasper and Brereton and Tong's parental stress reduction intervention, and we wanted to do a direct comparison of outcomes. Um, even more unique is we did this within the structure of an already state-of-the-art, really um, excellent early intervention program. Um, and so that program served as the backdrop. So all of these toddlers were receiving 30 hours a week of really high quality therapist delivered ABA services. And we were looking to see, could we actually add benefit to that program by adding a bit more of either one of these active treatments that focus more specifically on parent involvement. The program itself is teacher-led, um, has therapist involvement, so we wanted to add in a parental involvement component and see if we could find added benefit. So just as an overview, again, a busy slide, apologize, um, but you know, we're looking at a about two and a half year old, so just right in that toddler range we were talking about. Um, largely male, Caucasian, male, um, little boys were participants. Um, and they were showing some significant delays at two to three years of age. Um, mothers were roughly 35 years of age who participated. Um, there actually was an almost significant finding here for the treatment group having slightly older mothers, so we controlled for all of that in our analyses. Um, and these were highly educated mothers as well, so something to think about. Sometimes the university samples we get um, tend to be not as representative of some of the general community. So in general, um, we had, we think, some really nice findings on um, overall dyadic outcomes, social engagement, um, between the mothers and their children. And so essentially the amount of time that, that children and parents spent interacting together in play-based routines and communicating together almost doubled in our treatment group, uh, in our JASPER condition, compared to the condition where the parents received a stress reduction intervention. Um, and this treatment effect was maintained at a six-month follow-up. Um, so we feel like we're actually making some, last, some nice lasting dyadic changes um, in these parents and children. But what I think was most compelling, or one of the more compelling findings, new findings, is that this work seemed to also generalize to the classroom. And um, so what we taught children and parents in our JASPER intervention actually translated to the, to, the, to the classroom and to novel teachers who were interacting with these children. So we did not deliver the therapy to the teachers. We didn't give them any training. And yet the children in the JASPER condition were able to maintain these social interactions longer with their classroom teachers under observation. So it's a nice measure of generalization of, of skills and, and findings um, that we think is particularly relevant. So I'm going to show you a few clips um, just to give you a flavor of, um, of some of our treatment of Jasper. And in particular, this is only going to highlight a very brief period of time, um, two months in a child's development. So it comes and goes like that. Um, this intervention was only 10 weeks long. And, um, but I want you to notice the mothers, the change in the mother's behavior that may be helping to facilitate some of this early social communication as well. It's already up. It's finished. Come on. Push. Push hard. The other way. This way. Come on, push. Yay, you did it. That was hard, eh? I'm sure this, cap this child is capable of a lot of great things, but he's pretty object-focused here, right? I mean, and those, those musical toys, oh, I try to get rid of them as quickly as I can because they are attractive. Um, <laughs> and so he's, he's very object-focused. Mom is being as upbeat and responsive as she can be, but she doesn't have a lot to work with. You know, he's, he's pretty focused on what he's doing. So at the end of treatment... Ah, oh, I'm going to put this one here. You put that one there. Um, I take this one and this one for me. Where shall we put it now? Okay, I put this one there. Now your turn. 
Whose turn? Mm, Mama's turn. So you can see in general there's just a lot more interaction going on. There's, I mean, and some of it is just because they're facing each other now, which is a huge thing and one of the first strategies to look at. Um, but you know, he's clearly has a social partner and mom is very actively involved in the play activity as well. She's setting up opportunities to be, to be a social partner with him. You know, conversely, he's initiating a lot of gesturing and social communication with mom. So in general, we learned some, some several important things from this randomized control trial. Um, basically, that a parent-mediated approach seems to be very important for improving dyadic interactions in, with, with young children with ASD and their parents. So it can be very empowering. Parents reported really high satisfaction. They felt like they had some tools now um, that helped empower how they should interact with their child at home, in the car. In, in school. Um, and these findings generalize to a classroom and a novel teacher, really suggesting that Jasper may be um, helping the child to maintain social interaction better, even in a generalized setting, which is, I think is very important. The transfer of skills into new settings, which classically has been criti criticized in more traditional approaches, seems to be really working very nicely in these more developmental, targeted social communication therapies. Um, it's important to note, though, that all children, regardless of what treatment they were randomized to, did improve in their joint attention and language skills from exit to, and that six-month follow-up. And what this really suggests is potentially a combined approach of both intensive therapist delivered and parent-mediated approaches may actually be most effective for young children on the spectrum. So they were all receiving an, an excellent early intervention program. All children within that early intervention program were making tremendous gains, and we were able to augment the parent-child interaction gains, gains very nicely in this targeted social communication intervention. So the future of this particular line of research is actually happening right now. And so just as you're all part of the community, I wanted to um, uh, let you know that this is going on. Um, this is a downward extension of the program I just presented, the JASPER model, for actually children at risk for the disorder who are 12 to 22 months of age. So we're now we're going even lower to children who may not even have um, you know, diagnoses of ASD, but maybe showing early signs of the disorder. And we'd like to intervene as soon as possible with those children. And based upon what we learned in our last intervention, we are now um, employing a classroom design ourselves. Um, it's an eight-week program where we're actually combining both therapist-delivered and parent-mediated approaches for these young children. Um, we also have a big emphasis on psychoeducation and access to services. So all parents are given a lot of information about the system. We, we you know, do our part to help them access early intervention past our program, which I think is an important piece for all parents who are grappling with this early in a child's development. Um, in addition, we're following children over about a year until their diagnostic kind of status can be more stable. Um, we really want to know developmental trajectories. We want to know what's going on with these children over longer periods of time. And this leads me to more current trends in the field, which is actually longitudinal work. Um, which I, I employ us all to think about. So short-term gains and also what's happening longitudinally with these children is incredibly critical. Um, so Deborah Fine and colleagues actually found um, a small subgroup of children recently where she considered they had optimal outcomes. And these optimal outcomes were described as being children who were indistinguishable from their peers um, through observation and who no longer met full uh, criteria for an ASD. Um, and there's some, this is a fairly argued and hotly debated, you know, idea in the field, do children actually um, 
move into a state where they're no longer meeting full criteria for ASD along different points in their development. And um, reports are somewhere between three, it's a wide range, three to 25% of individuals may fall off the diagnostic spectrum at some point in their life. Um, and of course, this is considered an ideal outcome um, for many, many families um, and for many, many researchers. We would love that to, um, to, be, to be something um, that is a real and improving outcome. But early intervention now essentially has rarely followed children over time, so we don't know a lot about this. We have been interested in looking at follow-up um, of our children at UCLA, and we looked at children who received the preschool version of our original randomized control trial. If you remember back, those are the children who I showed you all the four graphs earlier, where they all did better in initiating and language compared to a control condition. Well, we wanted to get all those children back at a, at a five year follow up. And we wanted to see what they looked like then at eight to 10 years of age. Um, and so we have a, a recent publication actually outlining some of the longitudinal effects on language in these children. And we have a publication in press now um, looking at developmental trajectories of joint attention skills. And I'm gonna go into each of those a little bit with you. Essentially 40 of the original 58 children came back for, the, for this five year follow up. Um, and 80% of them had achieved what we considered functional usage of language, which we think is really great. Many, many of these children, the vast majority, were actually able to communicate um, with, with others and had developed some very functional language. Um, in our particular sample, 20% of them actually no longer met criteria, um, or no longer met full diagnostic criteria for ASD. Um, and that may be unique or it may fit in with that three to 25% of kids who actually do, you know, fall off the spectrum at some point in their lives. So when we looked at what predicted language outcomes in these kids when they were eight to 10 years of age, we looked at several things. First, we looked at what predicted their group membership, that 80% who was gonna gain functional language versus the 20% who were gonna remain what we consider more minimally verbal. Um, and we found, by and large, from our early measures of these children, one of the single best indicators was um, the level at which they were able to play when they were three to four years of age. Um, and you think about it, that is just a generally a very important milestone for young children. Um, in general, children who are able to play at a combination level, so able to kind of build, put puzzles together, were much better off than children who hadn't acquired those skills yet, who were doing more single acts on objects or who, who were treating all, all objects indiscriminately. We also were interested in what predicted the quality of language in those children who had, who had gained enough language for us to really measure. Um, and uh, this was a particularly exciting finding for us in that you know, we replicated the idea that earlier age of entry was better overall. So again, early intervention and the earlier the better. So, um, so it was important. Initiating joint attention, so that link between early pre-linguistic gesturing and later expressive language was replicated in this finding as well as play, um, you know, the ability, and that may also have to do with more kind of social interaction, may load onto cognition as well a little bit. Um, but what surprised us is that also treatment assignment fell out as a really significant predictor of um, children's overall language ability, suggesting that even five years post this brief treatment, we're actually, we, we made meaningful gains in children's outcomes um, in terms of their language. We also looked at developmental trajectories over time, and um, this, is an, this is an update from last year. If anyone was here last year, we talked about this, and it actually led me to the next analysis, so I hope I can answer a question now. Um, so in general, we looked at three joint attention skills over time. No one has really looked at it past kind of early childhood, so we wanted to know what these skills do as children get older. And the typical literature would say that most of these most of these skills might diminish with time as language starts to replace early gesturing. So we looked to see what would happen with our children on, our, on the spectrum. And lo and behold, we have some skills 
that continue to increase over, over the age range. So this is coordinated joint looking, or the ability to shift attention between others and objects of interest through eye gaze. This continues to accelerate through this developmental period. As well as, even though it's down here, so it's overall dampened and less frequent, but this is the skill of showing to share attention. And so you see that, for the most part, our toddlers are doing none of it, but there is this nice little bump and it continues to go up over um, the later childhood where children are actually continuing to show, to share interest. What was interesting for us is the skill of pointing to share. I would say in general, the point is something that we all think about, you know, it's an early red flag if our children are not pointing. Um, we, want to, we want to have it a treatment target. And this did a very interesting thing. This seemed to accelerate over the preschool years, and then it diminished to almost nothing past that period. And so it made us wonder, you know, what's going on with the point? You know, we'd imagine that these children would, you know, continue to gain these skills like the other um, joint attention skills. And so it led me to um, an analysis, a cross-flag panel analysis, where I was actually able to look at you know, was early pointing still significant and important for language development, even though it seemed to diminish over time? And lo and behold, um, I was able to actually test a causal model, and it was incredibly significant, which is um, exciting to suggest that early pointing actually is causally related to expressive language. So, so this is the first of its, of its kind to kind of suggest that one specific skill actually is, is, is very, very valuable to later language development, and the relationship did not exist for the other joint attention skills um, that I measured over time. So there really is power in pointing at a young age, and I think it's something we want to think about as we think about important treatment targets for young children on the spectrum. So in general, um, early interventions, social, early social communication interventions, um, in Jasper in particular, has shown some really nice lasting effects, the longitudinal effects on child outcomes. And it also has presented this idea that both the approach you use and when you use it may be critically important for child, children's development and something that we all as a field should be thinking about. Um, as, as way of wrap up, um, you know, there's been some themes in the field that have been emerging and I've tried to articulate them throughout the talk, but I want to kind of um, uh, reiterate them again now. Um, there really seems to be a movement towards more targeted approaches um, in general in behavioral interventions uh, with a focus on actually remediating and, and changing core features of the disorder. So comprehensive programs are not necessarily out, but targeted, more short-term, brief perhaps interventions that can come in at a distinct period in development and really augment development seem to be an important and exciting new avenue for us. Um, it also suggests that we might be moving more towards a modular treatment approach where a child may not need all of one type of approach for 30 to 40 hours a week, but may actually benefit from different approaches spread across um, different areas of development that may all play in and maximize child outcomes over time. Um, obviously, longitudinal and research treatment designs um, and rigorous treatment designs are still needed as replication is sorely needed in many of these intervention approaches. Um, and I, I have to just put a nod out to, even though my, my intervention focus is on young children, preschoolers, toddlers, um, you know, early, early at-risk children, um, that's not to say that we, need, we don't need empirically supported treatments for our older individuals on the spectrum, our, you know, our adolescents and our adults. And um, it's been um, a mission of ours at the CAN clinic, the Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic here, to start to develop some treatments for these individuals. And so um, stay tuned for um, more treatments for um, older individuals on the spectrum. 
So just as a way to wrap up, I just have a few short clips because I always like to l leave it with, with something that I think is amazing. Um, and this is a little boy who we followed longitudinally for, uh, this is a, about a five year span. And it just shows the remarkable, I think, incredible change that these young children can make over time. So the first clip, will he'll be a little under the age of two. And the second clip, he'll be almost five. So that's the only vocalization he made at entry. He had a grunt, he didn't have any real vowel or consonant sounds, no babble. So he was significantly speech and language delayed. Um, and here he is when he came back. And I have to tell you, he came down the hall at this follow-up appointment, looked at me and said, hi, Dr. Amanda, nice to see you. And I about, <laughs> I about hit the floor. <laughs> he came back from, they were living in, uh, in Tennessee, I think, so I hadn't seen him in a long time. And here he is playing with his mom. I can't see a dirt glitch down there. Am I safe? So, you know, clearly he's communicating, clearly they're having some really nice interactions there. Um, and it just um, makes what I do all the much more sweeter um, to see these types of outcomes in our children. So, um, thank you very much. There you go, there's nothing good. If you think it's possible to generalize, uh, yeah, all those mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. So absolutely, we're actually in the process of, um, we were just an, awarded an early access to care grant through Autism Speaks, um, where we are gonna do just that. We're gonna take Parent Mediated Jasper into the community, and we're going to deliver it um, in community agencies with parents and young children who are um, under-resourced and underserved in um, South Los Angeles. Um, to look at generalizing findings of Jasper, because I agree it's something that we definitely need to replicate in a more generalized population. How do you know that uh, the child just was, wasn't a late developer and this just happened spontaneously? It's a good question. I mean, the randomized control design helps us kind of understand that um, because it's a careful research design where we measure, you know, children pre, post, and at longitudinal follow-up, and we also randomize them to different treatments. So we can attribute their change to treatment more than um, a research design where you're just looking at children's growth over time and trying to explain it. I would say in general, that's probably the best way we can we can. Really Really look at that. So you did a follow-up after five years mm -hmm. and were, were there other interventions that these children participated in? Yeah, and actually last year I presented on some of that work. So they, they were in everything imaginable and we surveyed that. It's actually very hard as a researcher though to clearly document what happens to children once they leave your program because they go all different ways for all different intensities and then we rely on parents to report what therapies they had and what intensity and that sometimes can be incredibly hard when your child's in and out of different approaches but in general they all received equivalent amounts of intervention so what we did is we distilled it down to number of hours of intervention these children received uh, from leaving us to the five-year follow-up and those were all equal across all of the groups we measured as well so no, so no, no child received more intervention than another child. And I can't remember exactly, the, because they all entered into school. So I would say that the averages ended up being more like 30 to 40 hours, but you're considering 30 hours of school-based intervention. Would you consider making your parent 
training available online or on YouTube? We would love to, and I think it's where we where we need to go with this um, for sure. You know, now we've done, you know, enough. We've am amassed enough evidence, and now we're ready to for the dissemination phase. Um, and so, it's definitely an effort that's underway. Um, I do do some of these treatment approaches um, in the clinic that I, I direct now, but obviously, that's not enough to make it more more widespread and available. Thank you for that suggestion.